Okay, so it's time to get started with our last session of the conference. So, uh, yeah, this is our afternoon session. I see people are streaming in, so maybe we'll let folks come in for just a minute. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're good to start. So, fantastic. So our, our first talk of the session is gonna be on Blitz uh, by Lucas Moyer. So looking forward to the talk. Okay, thanks. So, hello again. Uh, I'm Lukas Aumeyer. I'm a PhD student at the Technical University of Vienna. And as I promised you yesterday, uh, today we'll talk about uh, Blitz, secure multi-hub payments without two-phase commits. So this is a joint work that we did together with Pedro Moreno Sanchez, Aniket Kate, and Matteo Maffei. Uh, so maybe to briefly outline what I'm gonna talk about. So Blitz is in a nutshell a new multi-hub payment paradigm for payment channel networks that is more efficient, uh, smaller in size, uh, reduces the collateral lock time from linear to constant, and is secure against certain type of attacks compared to uh, like more prominent uh, schemes as for instance Lightning. Okay, so let me jump in with some motivation background. So again, uh, most permissionless blockchains uh, suffer from the same issue, scalability. We have this global data structure called the blockchain. And in the blockchain, basically every transaction is recorded. And on top of this, we run a global consensus in which basically everyone checks the whole blockchain and verifies the transactions. So this creates a bottleneck, actually. And for instance, if we look at Bitcoin, uh, the transaction rate is very low, about tens of transactions per second. And if we compare it with more centralized uh, payment systems, such as, for instance, Visa, they can manage tens of th thousands of transactions. So there's actually quite a large gap. And so one of the ideas is uh, off-chain solutions. And the, the intuition behind it is basically that instead of putting every transaction on the blockchain itself, uh, we try to exchange as many transactions as we can off-chain, and we use the blockchain itself basically more as a fallback, so if there are any disputes. So specifically in this talk, again, I wanna focus on payment channels, and uh, they work like this. So let's look at three phases. We have Alice and Bob. They anticipate many payments between one another, so what they can do is they can open a payment channel. They do this by uh, locking some coins in a multi-sig address, so they put a transaction on chain, but they lock some money, and then from this transaction, they create what we call a state. This is basically a transaction that spans from this uh, locked money that they put and redistributes the money back to themselves. So this is the state zero, right? Once they did this, what they can actually do is they can update the channel, and they simply do this by creating a new state where they redistribute basically the balance and they can pay one another back and forth. And they can do this as many times as they wish. And once they're like happy, what they can do is they can close the channel and they do this simply, one of the parties sends the latest state to the blockchain and they get their money back. And you, you will notice that um, with payment channels, two party can perform arbitrarily many payments between one another and only two of them will end up on chain. Okay, so this is still not an ideal solution, right? Because if you were to use only payment channels, you would need to open a payment channel to every person that you potentially wanna interact with, right? And this is unfortunately not feasible since for every payment channel, what you need to do is you need to lock up some money that you cannot use otherwise. And you also might not know in advance whom you actually wanna pay to in the future. So it's also not feasible to open up with everyone and you will need to put transactions on chain. So we actually need to have a better solution. And this is where payment channel networks can come in. And the idea behind them is that we actually take uh, the, the payment channels and we link them to form a network. And then in this network, you use something that is called multi-hop payments where basically any two users that are connected via a path of uh, channels can perform a payment between one another. And again, the most prominent example for this is the Lightning Network. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, there was like 94 million 
uh, dollars worth of Bitcoin locked in the Lightning Network. They had like 18K nodes and 87K channels. Uh, so let's now briefly jump into how the multi-hop payments work in the Lightning Network, such that we can see how, how they can be improved. Okay, so suppose Alice wants to pay five coins to Dave via a path uh, of where there, there are the two intermediaries, Bob and Carol. So what they do is they perform the following steps. So first, Dave samples some pre-image X, hashes X to Y, and sends Y to Alice. Alice then goes ahead and sets up an HTLC, which is a hashed time lock contract with Bob, holding these five coins, and an HTLC encodes the following logic. Either Bob gets the money if he knows a pre-image X, such that X hashes to the condition Y, or Alice will get the money back after some timeout. In this case, the timeout is 3T. Okay, then Bob will set up the same HTLC with Carol, although the time now is only 2T, and I will get back to this, why this has to be the case. And finally, Carol sets up an HTLC uh, with Dave that is the same, except now the time is only 1T. Right, so once this has happened, what Dave can do, since Dave knows the pre-image X, Dave can actually open the HTLC and redeem his uh, five coins. However, in doing so, Dave actually reveals X to Carol, and then Carol can redeem the five coins from Bob, and then Bob can redeem the five coins from, from Alice. And the payment is successful. Okay, so this is in a nutshell uh, how the multi-hop payments work in the Lightning Network. Okay, so I wanna point out a couple of things here. So first, uh, this payment is executed in two rounds. We also call this a two-phase commit scheme. And what I mean by round is basically a sequential pairwise communication from the sender to the receiver or from the receiver to the sender. So and as we can see, we have the first round, basically, where the money is locked in the HTLCs. And we have the second round, where then the money is again unlocked. So two rounds of communication. The second thing I wanna get back to is what I already briefly mentioned is this time lock, right? And the timing, as I mentioned, grows from Dave, the receiver, to Alice, the sender, and it increases by one T for every hop. So it's asymptotically linear, uh, and since it's increasing, we also call it a staggered uh, lock time. And let me also point out that uh, in Lightning, this small T is actually one day, so the, the timeout increases by one day per hop. And the reason why this needs to be there is if you imagine that for instance, a malicious, so if, if the timing was the same everywhere, a malicious Dave could actually redeem his five coins at the last possible moment, so just uh, seconds before T would expire, and this would give Carol not enough time to react and also redeem her coins from Bob. So we need to actually give Carol more time to redeem her coins. So this is, this is the reason for why we need this. Okay, so, let me sum up here some properties and also some drawbacks of the Lightning payments. So first of all, I wanna point out that this is actually already a quite a nice solution to the scalability issues because now we can really be, we don't need to open a payment channel to everyone, but we can just use a, a more sparse network and we can actually use this, the, the paths of, of channels to, to pay to one another. Secondly, it also achieves something that I'm gonna call here like balance security. And on a very, very high level, it just means that the honest users, they're not at risk of losing their money. And finally, it also achieves some sort of privacy. And again, I put it here in quotation marks. On a high level, you can think of it as the users on the path, in case that there is a successful payment, learn only about their direct neighbors, not about who is on the whole path, and they also learn about the payment amount. So, but importantly, they don't learn the whole path. Okay, so now to some drawbacks, and I already mentioned two of them. So first is the staggered collateral lock time. This is an issue because um, in case that the payment does not succeed, and this can happen for multiple reasons, right? So there can either be 
like uh, users being offline or network outages, but it could even be that the users are malicious and actively trying to like grief the network. So if the money is locked up for a longer time, this means that the network throughput is actually decreased. So it can become problematic. The second point I also already mentioned, it takes two rounds. And of course, it would be both in theory and practice be nice to manage it in one round. Uh, also, another point I want to briefly mention it is that it requires the HTLC scripting requirements. So again, you rely on the blockchain supporting the hash locks for uh, for implementing this. And finally, there is also this uh, wormhole attack that was pointed out by Malavolta and others, where in a nutshell, uh, malicious users that are surrounding honest users can steal their, not their funds, but their fees, basically. And so this is also another issue that, that is in the lightning payments. So now the question that we ask ourselves is, so can we basically come up with a payment scheme that has, of course, the nice properties of lightning, but also increases uh, or improves on these drawbacks. And, and can we do this in one round? So, and obviously, so we all answered this in a positive way, and I want to go over you with uh, over the construction now. And let's do it in a way where we start out with a like simple uh, solution approach, and then we see what are the problems with those, and uh, we try to improve it until we get to the actual construction. So one very simple way of uh, doing this, and keep in mind our goal is to now do these payments in one round. So one simple way of doing this would be like this, right? This is really, really simple. So we just go ahead, and the first step is that Alice just gives five coins to Bob and says, please forward this to Dave, right? And then the, Bob goes ahead and pays five coins to Carol, and Carol pays five coins to Dave. So and this is actually something that was also uh, proposed in this uh, paper, Interledger Payments. Um, the, the obvious drawback with this is that it relies on the intermediaries being honest, right? So it could be the case that, you know, Bob is malicious and uh, the attack is not very complex. Simply what he needs to do is he just can go offline after receiving the five coins and the, the money will not reach Dave. So this is an, an issue. So basically, towards the solution, what, what we could try and do to prevent this is we could try and introduce a, a way for Alice to step back from the payment if the payment doesn't reach Dave. So let's actually try and do this. So we do something that kind of looks like this. So Alice still pays to Bob, but Bob only gets the money after some timeout capital T, right? And additionally, we introduce a way for Alice to step back from this pay payment. So basically, this is the error going back to herself. Um, and this she can use in case that Dave doesn't receive the money. So they set this thing up, right? And then if it reaches Dave, Dave sends back the confirmation. Uh, Alice uh, will simply go idle and the payment will go through. If it doesn't reach Dave, then Alice can step back, step back from the payment. So still this, is, this uh, has some problems, right? So there are actually two problems, right? So the first one is uh, only Alice should be able to step back from the payment if it doesn't reach Dave, whereas here everyone can step back from the payment. Or the other issue is that basically the timeout is again the same, and potentially the, the subsequent users will not have time to react. So what could happen, for instance, is that they set this up, and then moments before this timeout capital T expires, a malicious Bob simply re refunds himself, basically, uh, which would cost, in this case, Carol to lose uh, five coins. So we need to think of something a bit uh, more clever. And Again, one way, and I promise this is the last one before we reach actually the solution, is uh, we could actually reintroduce in some way some uh, hash locks, right? So if we condition the refunds on some hash lock uh, to which Alice knows the pre-image, right, 
we already would have uh, solved the problem that only Alice can uh, trigger these refunds. And to get rid of the problem that the subsequent users have enough time to react, what we would do is we could, of course, still uh, uh, introduce this staggered timeout, right? So we could give Bob just a bit more time to react and then Carol even more time. Uh, and this, so it, this seems to work, right? But it doesn't solve the issues that I pointed out in the beginning. So we still have the same scripting requirements as the Lightning Network. And we also have the collateral time that grows linearly. OK, so, so now let's talk about what is the actual solution. So how do we overcome this problem? And we call this the payer revoke paradigm. And basically, the way it works is as follows. So Alice at first defines a timeout capital T, which is independent of the path length. OK, then Alice creates a transaction which we call refund enabling transaction, or short TXER, right? This is a transaction that Alice does not put on chain, so she keeps this off chain. And this transaction has some outputs. Actually, it has one output for all of the users except for the receiver, Dave, right? So three outputs. And these outputs contain a very, very small amount, epsilon. So you can think of the, the smallest possible, possible amount. So like one Satoshi or maybe one Dust or whatever, right? So it's a pretty insignificant amount. OK, so now what Alice does is she sets up uh, a contract to Bob in the following way. Either after this time, capital T, Bob receives the money, or before this time, Alice can refund herself, but only in the case that she before published the transaction TXER. So how can we ensure this? This is where these epsilon outputs come into play, right? We can actually uh, make the refund transaction so that it takes this additional input, in addition to these five coins that we locked up in the channel, it takes this input, this epsilon output that is in the transaction TXER, right? And this ensures that the refund transaction can only ever be valid if both of the outputs that it spends are on chain, right? So it really, we really require this transaction TXER to be on chain. OK, so they set this up. And then Bob actually sets up the same thing with Carol, but with the refund transaction being dependent on his epsilon output of TXER. And finally, Carol does the same with Dave with the third epsilon output. OK, so and this is basically. Uh, the payment. So now it's more or less done. What we need now is only that Dave sends back the confirmation, right? So ba Dave sends back, I, I received a payment of five coins that is conditioned on this transaction TXER back to Alice. And if Alice sees, okay, the transaction that Dave sent matches the one that I created in, in the beginning, then she's fine. She can simply go idle, right? She will not post the transaction on chain. And she can be sure that after the time t, Dave will automatically receive the money, right? Because the refund in the channel Carol Dave is conditioned on this transaction TXER being posted on chain. So if it's not posted, Alice is sure that Dave gets the money. Right. In the case that Alice does not receive the confirmation, she, of course, wants to step back from the payment, right? So she doesn't want to pay uh, someone when it doesn't reach Dave. So what she does is she simply puts this transaction TXER on chain before this time tap capital T. And then everyone, right, because now the epsilon is on chain, everyone can actually refund the channels and the payment is reverted, right? Um, and the, the thing I want to highlight is, and this is also why we can have a, like a constant timeout t. It doesn't grow in a staggered way, and it's not linear, right? So it's a really a constant time. And the reason why we can get it is because everyone will see the transaction TXER going on chain at the same time. This is really one of the key points. Maybe also let me uh, finally point out that why the intermediaries are okay with this, right? So why would it, so how is an intermediary uh, sure not to lose money? 
And th the reason for this is also quite intuitive, uh, since basically an honest intermediary will construct his refund transaction on the same TXCR as his left neighbor, right? So this implicitly means if his left neighbor can refund, he can also refund. So this is also why the intermediaries are safe. Okay, so there's a bit more to the scheme uh, that you can look up in the paper. For instance, uh, we, imp we, we uh, present a way on how you can do a, f we call it a fast track for payments. So for, if you don't want to wait until this timeout capital T, right, you can introduce an optional second round of communication such that the payment goes through immediately, right? So before we had one round, but you had to wait until this timeout T, and if you have an optional second round, it goes through instantly, or more or less instantly. The second one is you can also, uh, if the users are honest, you can also uh, implement a mechanism such that uh, the payment is reverted without posting the TXCR. Uh, and I also want to briefly mention that um, uh, privacy, right? Because if we share the TXCR, uh, which basically contains an output for all the users, and we don't kind of hide who these users are in some way, then everyone will learn about the whole path. So how we can prevent this is instead of putting the actual addresses in this TXCR, we can use uh, stealth addresses to kind of hide uh, the identities of the users on the path. So feel free to check out the papers for more information on this. Um, finally, I want to talk a bit about some uh, comparison and ev uh, evaluation results. So re we compared our scheme to Interledger Payments, Lightning, Anonymous Multi-Hop Blocks, uh, and, and our scheme, right? And I want to briefly point out that before, what you had to do is you ha either had to decide do you want balance security uh, and two rounds, or do you want to have one round and no balance security? And now we can actually have both. And as I mentioned, we, we reduce the collateral lock time to constant. Uh, we are not susceptible to this wormhole attack that I mentioned, and we also don't need hash locks to implement the scheme. So for the evaluation, we did kind of two things that I want to mention briefly. So first, I want to point out that the Blitz contract is actually 26% uh, smaller than a Lightning contract, the HTLCs. So this would allow us to potentially put more concurrent payments per channel. And the intuition behind this is a transaction has a limited size, right? So you can only put so many HTLCs in one transaction. But now if you have a smaller contract, you, cannot, you can, of course, put more, more of these contracts in, this, in the transaction. Uh, and further, we did a simulation on the Lightning snapshot, where basically we, we took a snapshot of the Lightning network, we simulated some random payments, and we, we simulated that some of them are being disrupted, either being by be users being offline, or you know, they could be malicious or whatever. And then we, we looked at the effect of constant versus staggered collateral lock time, right? Because obviously the, the money that is locked for this time cannot be used for further payments. And we took a look at how many uh, payments failed, actually, in, in consequence of this. And what we found is that uh, in Lightning, actually, between 4 and 33x more uh, payments failed due to this uh, additional collateral lock time. So to sum up, uh, we have this new multi-hop payment paradigm. We achieve it in one round of communication. We reduce the con contract size. We reduce the collateral lock time from linear to constant, and we are secure against the wormhole attack. We only require signatures and time locks. We, we sh also uh, gave the simulation to show the advantage of constant collateral. We modeled it in the UC framework, and I also want to point out that it is compatible, actually, with the Lightning Network and Lightning Channels. Uh, maybe a, also a quick uh, like highlight of some follow-up work that we did from this. So, uh, you can check out the paper Thora, which will appear in this year's uh, CCS, where we basically channelize the concept of Blitz to uh, allow atomic updates on non-path topologies, so basically any topologies of payment channels. And finally, uh, Donna, which is a virtual 
a channel scheme that uses kind of blitz to, to achieve virtual channels over any number of hops. So thanks, and happy to take any questions. Yeah, not very nice construction. Are there any questions? Uh, so in, so that refund transaction, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So Alice has to, uh, has to always put it on chain, right? Alice has to put it on chain, yes. So let's say Carol doesn't want to proceed, it means that Alice has to go on chain, right? So, so if you don't get HTLC's uh, refunds for free off chain, as you would in Lightning. Right, this is true. So, so this is kind of one of the trade off is that if there's really one malicious user, so not in the case that someone goes offline, then you can honestly revert, right? But in the case that Carol is actively malicious, then yes, Alice has to put this transaction on chain. But actually only this transaction because the channels then can optimistically update themselves. Oh, same question. Wow, okay. Hi, I have a question. Uh, you said uh, your paper on CCS will work for any topology. What do you mean by any topology? Do, can you work for uh, cyclic uh, direct graphs? So what I mean by this is now, if you look at the payment, uh, if at the Lightning Network, right, you have a, a large number of nodes and channels, right? And uh, Lightning payments and, and also Blitz only works on like really paths. So Alice, who wants to pay to Dave, needs to be connected via Bob and Carol. So with uh, Thora, what you could actually do is, you know, you could update channels that are not even connected. So let's say you have the channel Alice and Bob, and you have some other channels like Carol and Dave, but Bob and Carol, they don't have a connection, for instance. So it could be, or you could even, you know, like branch out, so they update the channels Alice Bob and Alice uh, Carol, and so really any topology, yes. Okay, thank you. I have another question. Um, do you think your, uh, your technique can um, extend to cross-chain payment channels? That's actually a very good question. So the thing with this uh, is that really the, the atomicity on the refund, right? It relies on this transaction being posted on chain, right? And all the other transactions need to refer to this one. So the, the problem with using it cross-chain is that on another blockchain, right? If you have Bitcoin and then Ethereum, for instance, on Ethereum you would need some way to refer to this blockchain and somehow convince you know, the smart contract or whatever on Ethereum that this refund enabling transaction was posted on this chain. If you have something like this, then it could work, but uh, like just out of the box, it unfortunately won't work. Thank you. So I have one question on uh, just the uh, routing mechanism. So it sounds like in Blitz, Alice actually has to know the path that uh, she will take to, to Dave. Yes. It's not that the path can be adaptively chosen by the participants along the way. Yes, this is correct. So you really have source routing. Source routing, yeah. Yeah, which is, I mean, it's also true currently in the, in the current Lightning implementation that you also uh, have source routing, but here it's really a requirement, here it's, yes. Here it's kind of inherent, right? Do you think there's any hope of, of eliminating that? I mean, honestly, I currently don't really see how because you, you really have this transaction that you need to make up front. So it's not trivial, right? But maybe there's some way of coming up with a clever way of, you know, uh, dynamically adapting this transaction or so. But I, I currently don't see a, a simple way out, no. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, our next talk is actually a remote speaker. So we're going to play a video, and then the speakers are going to come from the other side of the world and answer questions. So hopefully that's, this will all work smoothly. So I guess we can start the video and then we can bring up, bring the speaker online. So yeah, this talk is by Tayal, who's gonna talk Decentralized about Decentralized blockchain systems and similar systems force us again and again to rethink basic concepts like security with incentives and how to scale systems. Today I'm going to focus on authentication and in the context of uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains, wallet design. This applies to uh, cash uh, with cryptocurrencies, 
to decentralized financial uh, tools, to NFTs securing your uh, board ape, and to central bank digital currencies with decentralized elements on their own. In all of these systems, the users secure their assets on top of the blockchain. So this will apply to individuals securing their own funds, to companies securing large amounts, to asset managed corporations and uh, exchanges that secure the funds of others. Actually, with just uh, a little bit of imagination, imagination, you can see that this applies to authentication in a general context, but I'll focus here on cryptocurrencies and blockchains. So in the blockchain context, there is no central party, and this makes the problem both harder and more important. If the uh, funds of the user are uh, lost because they lose their keys or stolen because someone steals their keys, there is no person, entity, or body that the user can appeal to to restore their funds. Now, the users in a blockchain choose their authentication mechanism. They implement it in a smart contract. We call this the wallet. The orders of the users and the authentication mechanism are both visible as they appear in the blockchain and prior to that in the, mempool, in the mempool. Authentication is typically done with cryptographic signatures, so the users sign their orders with the secret keys matching the public key uh, written in the contract in the wallet. And so we're going to say that the secrets maintained by the users are keys, even if they are technically not cryptographic keys. Now, client-side security obviously received a lot of uh, attention. The question of how to secure assets on a blockchain was one of the top problems listed in uh, systemization of knowledge works and uh, works reviewing cha challenges in the blockchain. And there are techniques for securing individual keys and for implementing a uh, combination of keys, so K out of N wallets. Uh, you can go further back to secret sharing techniques and to the uh, more contemporary methods of using threshold signatures where even when using the key at no point, no single entity holds the full key. There's been also work at the end of the 90s on authorization policies that's going to be slightly related to what I'm going to talk about today. But there, the question was how to implement authorization policy where different um, people in an organization are authorized to do different things with their keys. It's somewhat related, but it's more about the, mechanic of, the mechanics of implementing the policies and not exactly what we're going to talk about here today. So some prominent examples of uh, keys or credentials uh, that we're going to uh, think about. One is password. You remember it, you type it. Another is a physical device where you enter a PIN code and then it will sign your message. Another option is a safe deposit box in a, a faraway country where you put a piece of paper with your secret. A multi-key, K out of N, etc. can be implemented with, with the physical locks. You see an illustration here. Now we want to abstract all this away and so our model is going to be the following. We're going to have two principles in our world, an owner and the attacker. The wallet is what defines the authentication scheme, and the owner authenticates with keys. The attacker wishes to authenticate instead of the owner and uh, grab, uh, grab the asset. Now, keys can be in four different states. A key can be safe, meaning only the owner has access, or it can suffer three types of faults. First, the... Uh, owner might lose the key, and so no one has access to this key. Alternatively, the key can be leaked, so the owner still has access to the key, but the attacker also has access. And finally, the key can be stolen. In the event of theft, the attacker has the key, but the user does not, the owner does not. Going back to our examples from before, a password loss can be because it was forgotten, and it can be leaked because it was guessed by the attacker. There can be other forms of leakage, like key logging, but this is just an example. For the physical device, loss means the key was, uh, sorry, the pin was forgotten or, or the device was broken. Theft means the attacker both stole the device and guessed the pin code. In the case of a safe deposit box, locks could be uh, because there is no access, no, uh, the, the user, the owner cannot access 
the deposit box when it needs it. And finally, if we're looking at the, say, four out of six threshold signatures, we're going to treat them in this context as six separate keys, and the wallet is going to be a four out of six wallet for our roles. We're going to have n keys enumerated one through n. The state of key i is ki, uh, some state either safe, lost, leak, or uh, stolen. And the scenario is going to be a series, a vector of states where the ith entry is the state of the ith key. The owner and key availability vectors are derived from a scenario. So the availability of key i to the owner is sigma i o and to the attacker is sigma i a. Let's look for example at the first row in the table. If sigma i is safe, then the availability for the owner is true and the availability for the attacker is false. Going down to the leak line, if sigma i is leak, then the key is available both to the owner and to the attacker. Now each key is going to have a fault probability and the probabilities are going to be independent. So the probability that key i is safe is pi safe and so on. The probability of a scenario is therefore the product of the probabilities. So for n keys, we have four to the n possible scenarios. And in the table below, you see the probabilities assuming all keys have the same fault probabilities. So first row, uh, both of the state are safe, then the probability of this scenario is p safe squared, and the owner vector is true true, and the attacker vector is false false, and so on. Moving on, a wallet is a predicate on n availabilities. Let's look an, at an example. A wallet can require both K1 and K2 to authorize, uh, a, to, to authenticate the user, or it can require both K2 and K3. This is the wallet shown below. So W of A1, A2, and A3 is the availabilities, is A1 and A2, or A2 and A3. We say that the wallet is successful in a scenario sigma if the owner can satisfy it, but the adversary cannot. This is the expression below. And the probability of failure is the probability of an unsuccessful scenario. So now that we've defined, defined a wallet, we can start our search for the optimal wallet. The natural first approach is to do an exhaustive search meaning scanning the entire range of uh, possible wallets. Now to do this, let's think for a second and realize that wallets are monotone Boolean functions. In fact, the number of wallets is the number of all monotone Boolean functions, that's the dedicated number, minus two, because we don't care about the monotone Boolean functions, constant true and constant false. So for example, with uh, zero keys, we have no wallets, the dedicated number is two. With one key, we have one wallet, just K1. The dedicated number is three. With two keys, we actually have four options. We can use just K1 or just K2. We can use K1 and K2, and we can use K1 or K2, meaning the owner should present either K1 or K2 to authenticate. With three keys, we, need, uh, we have 18 possible uh, wallets. The dedicated number is 20. Uh, for example, just one of the keys, all of the keys, or any pair. However, we cannot go much further. The dedicated number itself is only known up to 8, and don't know even the dedicated number for 9, and naturally we cannot run an exhaustive search uh, for large numbers. So we use an evolutionary approximation, we start with some random population of wallets, and iteratively, until reaching the target population size, we select some, say, three uh, wallets from the population. We choose the best among these three. From this, we take this best wallet, we perturb it, meaning we flip uh, a couple of requirements uh, at random. We take the result and we add it to the next generation. We do this again and again until we have a new generation of wallets. And we do this again and again and again until the best wallet in the generation stabilizes. Now let's look at some examples. So first of all, with one key, uh, we are going to look at these sort of graphs. So let's uh, see what's happening here. 
the x-axis is the probability that the key is leaked, and the y-axis is the probability that the key is lost. We're going to have a constant theft probability of 1% here, and we see here obviously that as the probability of leakage and or of loss grow, the probability of failure also grows. With two keys, we're going to look at the end wallet and the or wallet. The end wallet requiring both keys favors key leakage. If loss is unlikely and a leak occurs, then no worries. But uh, the attacker, the owner, sorry, still has both keys. The or wallet favors loss if the if the leak probability is small, uh, because uh, if a key is lost, the owner is still going to be able to present one of the keys and win. But interestingly, uh, and uh, we're going to look here now at the best wallet for different ranges, and I'm going to th show it with a with a four percent theft probability. So the results are more pronounced. You see that when leak is likely and loss is unlikely, then the end wallet is optimal. And when loss is likely and leakage is unlikely, then the OR wallet is optimal. But in the middle range, the optimal wallet is in fact an asymmetric one, which is, which is using just one of the keys. And that's especially important close to the zero zero probabilities and that's where we want to be we naturally look for keys where their fault probabilities are small and there we see that the actual optimal wallet is one that uses just one key as we go to three keys we see similar trends only the curves are somewhat more interesting this is with the zero theft probability and this is with 8% theft probability. Interestingly, here, close to the zero probability, we see that the optimal wallet is actually going to be the wallet requiring any pair. And this is good news, because here our intuition um, matches the actual results, as uh, a lot of uh, practical uh, cryptocurrency wallets use any pair for, um, for their implementation. Now the transition to four keys is uh, raises a question: Do we want to use any pair or any triad of the keys? Uh, this is with a theft probability of zero. We see that if loss is slightly more likely, we'll prefer any pair. Whereas if any triad, uh, sorry, where there where where if leakage is more likely, then any triad is going to be better. If theft probability grows, then the situation becomes much more complicated. We're not going to go into this, but instead look more generally into how the system behaves as we increase the number of keys. In this graph and the ones we're going to look at next, we see the number of keys increasing from 1 to 7 in the x-axis and the wallet failure probability in log scale on the y-axis. With only loss and with only leak, we get the same results. The optimal wallet gets uh, exponentially better as we increase the number of keys. The black line shows the evolutionary uh, algorithm. In yellow, we see the optimum as we're able, we're able to go through all possible wallets. And in green, we see the best guess, testing all symmetrical wallets. If we have only theft, the situation is a bit different. The general trend is still exponential, but it goes in steps. So increasing from 1 to 2 gives us no advantage, from 3 to 4 gives us no advantage. You see here that the evolutionary algorithm can't reach the best guess. Uh, this is just demonstrating that it's not perfect. Here we have an uh, asymmetric situation. So the first key uh, has a theft probability and the others can only suffer loss. In this case, you see that the symmetric wallet, the symmetric guess is not optimum and the evolutionary algorithm can do better. The trend again is exponential, but it's not exactly that. And here's an important um, uh, result for, for practical reasons, telling us that uh, the quantity is more important than the quality. Uh, we see here the uh, improvement uh, in failure probability as we increase the number of keys, 
when where the loss uh, probability is different. In all cases, the theft probability is 1%, but we see that six keys with loss probability of 3% is an order of magnitude better than three keys with only 1% loss probability. This is important for practical reasons. And uh, here uh, we see what happens uh, when we can choose the type of key that we use. Let's look at uh, this example. We have uh, key uh, keys one and two have a loss probability of 10%. This is just for making things very uh, strong. Uh, so 10% loss probabilities for keys one and two. And the loss probability of key three goes between zero and 10% on the X axis. The leakage probability of the third key is the 10% complement. So 0 0.1 minus the leak probability. We somehow have a, a fault budget. And we see that through most of the range, when the loss probability is more likely for this third key, the best wallet is the two out of three, W two out of three, uh, like we had for, uh, for the symmetric situation. However, if the loss probability is very high, then we are actually fine with requiring just the third key for authentication, or alternatively, requiring both key one and two. Here, the situation is uh, a bit different. So we have 5% uh, leakage and loss probabilities for keys one and two. And we see a similar situation where through most of the range, two out of three is the best option. And at the very edge, we either, if, if the loss probability is high, then we, and, and the leakage probability is very small, then we can allow just key three for authentication. And on the other side, if uh, the loss probability of key three is very small, but the leakage probability is higher, then we will require key three definitely. So it will be one and three or two and three. This is uh, in the paper if you want to stare at it some more. And this is the practical result of this work. This is a cryptocurrency wallet designer. This is a design by Shalev Keren uh, from Zengo. And the um, most recent implementation is the result of a hackathon uh, project at the IC3 blockchain camp that won the first place. You can uh, choose here the number of wallets, the fault probabilities of each. You can try your own uh, uh, wallet uh, designs and you can ask for it to generate the optimal wallet. It will calculate up to a certain number and then it will also generate a smart contract you can directly deploy to Ethereum if you so wish. No warranty, etc. obviously. And that's it. So we talked about how to model authentication, in particular in the cryptocurrency and uh, digital asset context. We talked about keys, scenarios, probability, and wallets. Uh, we saw that it's possible to do an exhaustive search for a small number of keys, and then an evolutionary approx approximation uh, is quite useful. And this raises um, many questions for the future, just uh, three uh, examples. What is the optimal design for many keys? Can we uh, find uh, optimums when the keys are have uh, similar fault probabilities? What happens if the fault probabilities of wallet of keys are dependent? And an important question, which I haven't touched upon here at all, is usability. More keys means harder usability. How do we uh, choose the optimal trade-off? I'll be glad to talk about these and any other questions uh, available online and uh, glad to talk. Thank you. Thanks, Eyal. Decentralized ah. blockchain system. Perfect. And we have, a, by the magic of Zoom, we have uh, Eyal here. Can you hear us, Eyal? Hi. Yeah, it's hi. Excellent. OK, any, any questions? Um, so maybe I'll ask a question. So one thing I, I was curious about is how do you how how would you say users uh, should go about choosing the probabilities? Like how do, how would you uh, actually uh, you know select the numbers to put into your uh, into your uh, work uh, what is it your dashboard? 
Yeah, that's that's an excellent uh, question. Uh, the answer is so. Uh, speaking with people with uh, uh, certainly with a security frame of mind, I know that uh, just talking about this was already helpful for people who told me they've been uh, rethinking their uh, uh, security and their wallet design strategies, uh, even without accurate numbers. And for accurate numbers, uh, we'd need to do some sort of user studies. Uh, and if you start thinking about it, then some of this data is very hard to get because it doesn't get online, even though obviously all type of faults do occur. So this is an open question for a different kind of study than what I usually do. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Great. Any other any other questions? Ah, uh, oh, yes, we have one question. Excellent. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, it is. Um, so I see that you are saying that, like, for safe case loss, leak, and theft, it's symmetrical in the probability of happening. But is that actually true? And then, if it's asymmetrical, would that skew the results? Uh, so yeah, um, this is absolutely uh, uh, not true in practice. In fact, you would probably make an effort to choose keys that uh, have uh, d very different kind of, uh, f of fault probabilities. So putting a phone, sorry, putting a key on your wallet and putting a key in a safe deposit box have very different fault probabilities. Uh, some of the results I presented used symmetrical fault probabilities um, because already these produced interesting analysis. Others used asymmetrical types of keys, and uh, there you saw that the analysis for the analysis um, we saw trends that were not, for example, these clean uh, exponential, this clean exponential behavior. And there's there are open, uh, very interesting questions for uh, for future work on how to accurately calculate the optimal wallets for a large number of asymmetrical uh, keys. And uh, yeah. Got it, thank you. Great, ah, yeah, another, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just use your, maybe it's faster. Hi, I'm, I'm Yuri, uh, two quick questions. One, uh, in your example of uh, six keys with 3% probability loss are better than uh, three keys with 1% probability loss. Yeah. How many keys were needed to perform operations? Uh, um, these were the optimal keys. I don't remember. I don't remember what the optimal wallets was for these uh, uh, for for these specific numbers. I see. It, I guess like maybe link to slides will be later. Uh -huh. And then if you were building a wallet product today, like do you have any particular guidance as how you would approach key management? Simple question. Absolutely. So. Uh, th this apl this applies, uh, like I said in the video, this applies to uh, s securing digital assets uh, at any scale, from from personal to large corporations. And my my advice would be to to start uh, f feeding in numbers and see what optimal wallets you'd get. The um, uh, sensitivity of the optimal wallets to the accuracy of your estimates of these probabilities is also an interesting open question. But just by fiddling around with this calculator, you can already try to evaluate whether, uh, whether you're taking the, be the best course of action. Um, I, I can actually say that I've, uh, I, I know from, uh, should probably not name any names, but uh, large organizations securing large amounts are doing things that uh, by running uh, this, uh, these small tests are evidently not good. So for example, keeping a single, very, very secure safe key in one place uh, as, a, as an absolute fallback, uh, which we know from uh, this uh, rigorous analysis is suboptimal uh, in comparison to having three safes, maybe each a little bit less secure. That's, a, that's actually very good advice. Excellent. OK, great. Any more questions or um, uh, in that case? Thank you very much, Eyal, and uh, we hope to see you here next year. Yeah, bye. Thanks very much. I hope to be able to make it in person. Okay, let's see. So our next talk is on congestion windows. Where's our speaker? Is our speaker here? Ah, there you go. Excellent. Yeah, please come up. So I yell it. Yeah, so our next speaker is Ayelet, Ayelet Lotem. Uh, yeah. And the floor is yours. Looking forward to the talk. Yeah. 
these letters. Okay. My second. Hi everyone, I'm Ayelet Lotem. I'm a PhD student at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and uh, I'm going to show you my, uh, to present my joint work with Sarah, Patrick and Aviv on how to extend, to automatically extend uh, deadlines on the blockchain when there is a network congestion. Okay, so to describe it briefly, some transactions must enter the blockchain before a certain deadline. For example, in auctions. Bids must be placed before the auction ends. The problem is that in cases where the network is congested, these transactions might miss the chance to enter the blockchain in time. So in this work, we suggest a new mechanism that solves this by, presenting, by, by pro providing automatic extensions to these deadlines when there's congestion, and we also provide an implementation over Ethereum. Our motivation starts with the fact that many smart contract uh, applications often involve a mechanism in which some party must respond to a challenge or appeal some action uh, within a fixed time limit. We see it in auctions, in voting systems, in payment channels, and so on. For example, here's an auction which is triggered on the blockchain with a fixed deadline of T blocks after it starts. Bidders may submit their bids but only those enter the blockchain before the deadline will be considered valid. When we reach the deadline, the smart contract evaluates the bids and announces, announces the winner. Another example is in payment channels, where two parties can lock money in a channel between them and then make off-chain payments. They exchange signed transactions with their updated balance and they can settle their funds by sending the latest transaction on-chain. If one party tries to cheat and sends an old transaction on-chain, the other party has a limited interval of time to dispute the division of funds on-chain. Now we have a problem. What if the network is congested and we miss the chance to enter our transactions in time? Well, several attacks, uh, known attacks and failures can be attributed directly to this problem. For example, two years ago, on Crypto Black Thursday, the price of Ethereum dropped by more than 50% in less than 24 hours, causing a panic sale of coins, which increased congestion. We can see it in this graph. The fees have jumped dramatically on this event, and this indicates the congestion. The sharp drop in Ethereum price triggered many maker, maker DAO auctions at once to liquidate collateral. These auctions had very short deadlines and the congestion led to unfavorable conditions causing a malfunction in the auction system. As a result, many bidders did not manage to participate in time. This was leveraged by some users who have initiated auction with zero bids and one. Eventually, $8.3 million worth tokens were purchased at almost no cost. Another failure is presented in a research by Jonah Harris and Aviv Zohar. In this work, they present an attack where the attacker forces many victims at once to flood the, net, the blockchain with claims to the, uh, for their funds. This leads to congestion, which enables the attacker to steal the rest of the funds that were not claimed before the deadline. Now, to avoid this kind of situations, users take wider safety margins. They often overpay fees or set long deadlines in advance, which is not ideal since we're usually dealing with time-sensitive actions. We want to offer a more fundamental solution to the problem. We propose to set short deadlines that will be automatically extended when there's congestion. 
Now let's formalize it a bit. We define challenge response protocols as, consist, as consisting of a challenge for which there is a limited time window to respond to. To be more precise, responding to the challenge during the challenge window yields different results compared to responding after the deadline. We propose a protocol that inspects the challenge window period and extends it as long as the blockchain stays congested. This allows us to set shorter deadlines and use lower fees for the transactions. Now, in case congestion never stops, we define an absolute deadline by which the protocol must finish. Now, the main question that we, we need to ask now is how do we decide whether a period of blocks is considered congested? Then first, uh, we will break it into several steps. First, we will define what it means for a single block to be congested and make sure that, the, that this definition provides us with a reliable signal. And then we will use this definition to define congestion of, of periods on the blockchain. Okay. So we define the congestion signal of a single block by using the price of entering a transaction to the blockchain, that is, by using the fees. Formally, a block is theta gamma congested if at least a gamma fraction of its size is filled with transactions of fee density above theta. Now, can miners interfere and fake the signal derived from this definition? Um, we want congestion signals to be reliable. We want them to reflect the true state of the, ne the network. So we must consider that miners are the ones that decide on which transactions to include in the blocks, and therefore they are able to manipulate their congestion signals. For example, a miner can choose to include dummy transactions that pay fees to himself, making the fees appear different than they ought to be. However, miners are limited by their computational power. They can't manipulate any block at any time and such manipulations cost them in losing potential fees. In the paper, we provide the calculation of this loss. Now, we can use the congestion signals of single blocks to, def to define algorithms that decide whether a period on the blockchain is congested. Such algorithms are expressed by a binary function that takes as input the congested signals of the blocks in the examined period and outpu outputs zero if the period is congested and one if not. Before I propose different algorithms, let's examine what properties we would like them to maintain. So the first property is monotonicity, which says that if a period is uncongested, then any period that includes it is also uncongested. This gives us a, a kind of consistency in the sense that if during a period there was a time frame where we could submit transactions and end the protocol safely, then we could also do it during the entire period since it includes the time, that, uh, time frame. Now, monotone protocols are also easier to verify since we only need to select a portion of blocks from the time period in order to prove uncongestion. The second property is robustness against manipulation attacks. We want to make sure that the chance of a miner succeeding in reversing the natural congestion signal of a given period is very low. We refer to two types of attacks. One in which a miner fakes congestion and causes an unnecessary delay in the response deadline. And another in which the miner hides congestion, which may cause users to miss the chance to respond in time. The last property we'll talk about is efficiency. We want to have compact proofs for the lack of congestion, ones which Ethereum can easily process. Now, in addition, we want to be effective in our calculations. For example, when we grant an extension and need to inspect the extended period to see if we're still in congestion, we don't want to recheck blocks from the beginning of the period. We rather keep the necessary information from previous checks and check only the new blocks. We want this information kept from previous checks to be as concise as possible. Okay, now that we have defined the desirable properties, we can propose different algorithms and check whether they meet these properties. 
Now, uh, given the congestion signals of the blocks, we want to decide whether the whole period is uncongested. A naive suggestion might be to define it uncongested if at, it has at least n blocks that are not congested in it. Such protocol is monotone, but is not sufficiently robust to the attacks we pre presented previously. If we wait long enough, the probability of the adversary to control n blocks becomes very high, even if it has a little computational power. We solve this by considering the percentage instead. A period will be uncongested if x percent of its blocks are not congested. Now this provides us with robustness, but we lose the monotonicity. That's a problem since we might have a period that is uncongested during its first part, but then congestion begins and the new period will be granted extension although there was a first chance to respond to the challenge. So now we can enforce monotonicity and suggest a third protocol, which defines uncongestion by the existence of L consecutive uncongested blocks. This protocol is monotone and efficient, but is it also sufficiently robust? So now we can ask, how do we measure robustness? Well, we consider a manipulation, when we consider a manipulation attack, we consider an adversary with alpha computational power, meaning each block has a probability alpha to be controlled by him. We also make a simplifying assumption on the network congestion state, that blocks are congested independently with probability p. With these assumptions, we can now compute the probability of avoiding each of the attacks we defined previously. Now, these are the results of the evaluation of the robustness of the L consecutive protocol. We used Markov chains to calculate the probabilities of the attacker to succeed in each of the attacks for different L values. The red curve corresponds to the congestion attack and the blue to the uncongestion attack we see that there is no value of L that gives us sufficient defense against both attacks. The maximum that we get is about 90% defense rate if we pick L to be 11. Therefore, therefore, we find this protocol not sufficiently secure. Okay, after these uh, three failed proposals, we finally reach our winning proposal, the sliding window protocol which generalizes the L consecutive by, allow, by allowing for longer observation windows with a relaxed condition for uncongestion. In this protocol, we define uncongestion if there exists a window of N consecutive blocks with K uncongested blocks in it. For example, if we choose N and K to be four and three respectively, then this period will be considered uncongested if there exists a window of size four with at least three uncongested blocks in it. This protocol is clearly monotone. The existence of any uncongested window will indicate that the entire period is also uncongested. It is also efficient. To prove uncongestion, it is enough to submit the parameters of the uncongested window. Additionally, when repeatedly extending a period, it is enough to check only new windows that haven't been checked before. So the data we need to keep is only the last n minus one blocks of the previous extension. Now we also know that checking all blocks to determine congestion will requ require at most O of n space. At last, this protocol is also robust. We computed upper bounds on the probabilities of the, the attacker's success in each of the attacks using a sliding window of a size corresponding to one day in Ethereum. As can be seen from the graph, the probabilities are extremely low, showing the protocol to be very secure. In this table, we present the probabilities for smaller sliding windows. The wider the sliding window is, the greater the protection we get. Since the values of n and k are configurable, we can choose to increase the level of security for one attack at the expense of the other. 
And now we also provide an implementation in solidity of the protocol using the term proven proposal 1559 base fee to de determine block congestion. EIP implements a base fee that, that is adjusted up and down by the protocol according to how congested the network is. We suggest a new opcode for Ethereum that checks whether a block is congested. The Ethereum virtual machine already supports fetching the base fee of the highest block. We suggest extending this to fetch the base fee of any block and to add an opcode that checks whether a block is congested. This opcode will receive a block and a maximum base fee chosen by a user and will return whether the block's base fee exceeds the maximum base fee. If it exceeds, it, it is congested. Now to summarize, we tackle the problem that arises when challenge, uh, when challenge response protocols face congested periods. We propose to set short deadlines that are automatically extended if congestion occurs. We formalize the problem and introduce the sliding window protocol to detect congestion over multiple blocks. Our results show that it is possible to shorten deadlines significantly while expanding the security of the protocol to deal with congestion. And we provided an implementation over Ethereum. That's it, thank you for listening. I'll be happy to answer questions. Great, very interesting. So we have time for questions. Does anybody have any, any questions? Actually, I'm very curious, have you talked to the Ethereum Foundation about this? Like, what's, what's the reaction? Um, no, we have to, I haven't talked to them yet, uh -huh. uh, but uh, we will do. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, well, some of them are here, so maybe this is a, this is a good conversation to have. Yeah. yeah. Great, any, any more questions? Um, yeah, please, go ahead. Oh, you can use mine. Hi, um, thank you so much. I wondered if you looked at congestion and other situations like air traffic control or car systems for ideas on the mathematical modeling of, uh, that you did with blockchain. I heard the beginning, but oh. what are the examples that you gave? Uh, like air traffic control, airplane systems, vehicles and road and traffic congestion, uh, if there's similar modeling that comes up. Um, no, we are, uh, actually, n no, the, the, this paper, we dealt it in a very uh, high level theoretical way. We looked at the, the cases that we talked, auction, payment channels, but actually even above Bitcoin, you can see it over Bitcoin, but uh, actually it's much more easier to implement things over Ethereum because of the smart contracts. So at least if I understood right <laughs> your questions, then no. Hi, uh, I have one, have one question regarding the definition of one block is congested. It looks like you are defining it uh, with regard to the, the fraction of transactions that has higher fees, right? So I'm wondering what's the rationale behind this? Why do you define in this way? How practical it is? That's my question. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understood. Let me try to, to tell you what I understood. You're talking about the uh, different ways to detect b single block congestions. Why did we pick this method? Was this your question? Yes, Ali? yes. You have a definition for one block being yeah. congested and it's a fraction of transactions has higher fees. Yes. Gamma stuff. Um, yeah. First, uh, again, <laughs> if I hear correctly, mm -hmm. then uh, we, we checked different methods and in the paper we actually mentioned them in the appendix. And uh, you know, the, actually the way that we, we uh, defined it, as you said, is uh, we have a threshold of uh, if it's above uh, this and this fees, uh, fee density, if to be precise, then it's congested. But actually when we implement it, we use, we use EAP 1559 that does something a bit similar, right? So we use the, the, the price of entering the transaction to the blockchain as a reliable way. Are there other ways? Maybe, and that's okay because you can, like the way that we presented it, each one can decide what's the way he wants to define block congestion and 
uh, which protocol to use, which algorithm. Uh, in practice, you need to have uh, the ability to use it, to have an opcode or to have the ability to get the data from the blockchain. Okay, thank you. Hiya. Hi. Um, I was wondering, so it might happen that at the beginning you have an uncontested period and then all the remaining blocks are congested and then if you're kind of late to the party, you're not able to submit your blocks, your transactions. So would it make sense to kind of extend the deadline or not extend the deadline only if you have multiple opportunities to submit your sub, um, transactions? I am very sorry, I'm hearing only parts of, of what you're saying, but you, are you talking about uh, if you said if a period at the beginning is not congested and then congestion begins, then we said that we want monotonicity, right? Right, so I mean, uh, the, the problem is that if there is only a small, a short period of uncongested at the beginning and yeah. you were, let's say, offline during this period because you were assuming that later on you'll have ah, an opportunity okay. to submit your transaction, then, is that uh, the problem? Then you have like a, you have an initial deadline. At first it's not like, you, you need to start like in the sliding window, we can choose in, uh, in advance a, a sliding window, let's say uh, of size N that is, uh, that is lar large enough for someone to submit those transactions. You need to have like, you can pick the initial deadline and the initial deadline should give you enough time to react. Now, if there was no congestion, okay? Now, after, you, after this time, you want to extend it uh, according to the situation of the network, but you did have the initial time to do it. You, you understand? Like, if we're talking like about the sliding window and let's say that you think that it's enough, I don't know, 30 blocks are enough, uh, just uh, then, at that, then in the first extensions, you have at least 30 blocks to do it. And then you, you keep extending. You have this initial time. I think that answers your question. If not, you can ask me again. Thank you. Great. Very cool. All right. Thank you, Ayelet. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we're on to our last talk of the conference, last but not least. So Nusrit, we're looking forward to your talk about roll-ups. Is there like a, a charger? Great, because I'm almost out of charger. I should like. my voice coming all right okay hello everyone i uh, i am nusret and i will be talking about accountable safety for rollups the title is a bit different from the title you might be see on the schedule because i decided to focus on a specific aspect of the paper that i think is more relevant to the current discourse um, this is a joint work with my uh, uh, with uh, John Adler, uh, Mustafa Al-Bassam, Isma Kofi, Nima Waziri, and uh, my advisor, David Che. Okay, I know that everyone is excited to go to the party afterwards, so I just want, decided to include a key take takeaway slides in case you need to queue up in front of Noah. Uh, so the first key takeaway is uh, security of rollups has typically been shown um, relying on some trust assumptions, such as an honest majority on the parent chain of the rollup. However, in this talk, I would like to uh, get rid of these trust assumptions and uh, attain a trust minimizing notion of safety. Now, trust minimizing means different things to different people, but here what I mean is accountable safety, and I, I will subsequently define this and I define how it applies to rollups. 
and we will uh, see that to uh, prove accountable safety for rollups, we would need to impose some requirements on the rollup nodes. Namely, they should be able to, they should be validating the rollup state, which the full nodes are already doing most of the time, but now there's an extra requirement which is checking the data availability, or rather the availability of the parent chain blocks, which is uh, a bit non-traditional, and uh, we will come to that. Okay, so I would like this before introducing a model for the rollups and show how accountable safety is defined and applies to the rollup domain. I would like to start with some basics, and these basics will be very useful going forward. So, what are the requirements in a blockchain protocol? First of all, what is a blockchain protocol? So, I would like to think of it as a subset of state machine replication protocols. And in the subset, we, I'm, I'm thinking the transactions are batched into blocks, and these blocks are ordered by a consensus protocol. And uh, there are three requirements uh, on the validators of this blockchain protocol. The first one is consensus. These validators should be imposing a total order across these blocks. The second one is data availability. These validators should ensure that the data within these blocks are available and any external observer or client will be able to download these transactions if they want to. And the third one is execution. These validators should be executing these transactions and maintaining a state of the world. And typically this state is represented by succinct commitments and these commitments are posted, are uh, placed on the block headers. They are sometimes called state root. Okay, now we have seen these three features of a blockchain protocol. Uh, how, how, how does this help us understand what a rollup is? So a rollup is a layer two scalability solutions that was proposed for blockchains uh, to increase their uh, throughput scalability. And at the centerpiece of the rollup system is a parent chain. So this parent chain is responsible for, this parent chain is a blockchain protocol and is responsible for ordering uh, and the availability of the rollup transactions. And it's maintained by a set of nodes called the parent chain validators. And now besides the parent chain, I would like to conceptualize a rollup as also a rollup chain that runs in parallel to the parent chain. And this rollup chain consists of blocks uh, that are uh, created by sequencers. So now, uh, who are these sequencers? So these sequencers, they receive transactions from the users of the rollup, or sometimes they extract these transactions from this parent chain. They batch these transactions into blocks. And uh, I would like to also give them the task of executing them. I don't know if you guys were in um, Patrick McCory's talk in the morning. It was a great talk. Uh, he had a, a different set of nodes called executors here. But I will also additionally give these sequences the task of executing the transactions within the rollup blocks and then creating a state commitment after executing these transactions. However, the core idea in the rollup is not to trust the sequencer. So even though the sequencer executes these transactions and obtains a state commitment, these execution will be verified by the observers of the rollup. For instance, the users who might want to withdraw their transactions later on. And these observers come in two varieties. I would like to call them the rollup full nodes. The rollup full nodes download the whole rollup block. Note that this is not the parent chain block. This is just the rollup block. They download the whole rollup block and execute the rollup block whereas light clients uh, are much lighter. They won't be downloading the rollup blocks or executing all of them. Okay, this is uh, a lot of words on the uh, slide. So how do these uh, come together in a picture? So this is the traditional architecture that is very prevalent in the industry today. I will, I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to capture it through a picture. So here is our parent chain, and here is our sequencer. So the sequencer creates these rollup blocks and sends them to the parent chain. Now, in many architectures currently being designed or deployed, there is a bridge contract on the parent chain. And this bridge contract, what it does is that upon receiving a rollup block, it validates the state commitment within the rollup block. It might not be doing this by just executing the transactions, calculating the latest state, and obtaining its commitment, but it might be doing this through more lightweight methods, such as fraud proofs or ZK validity proofs, and so on. And if the state is valid, then it will accept the rollup block, and the rollup block will be included within the parent chain. Now, the parent chain is much more than the rollup block. It might have its own transactions that are separate from the rollup transactions. It might have other rollup blocks as well, and other bridge contracts for other rollups. 
Now, occasionally, this sequencer can be malicious and it can produce invalid draw up blocks where the trans either the transaction is invalid or the state uh, is invalid. In this case, the bridge contract will reject the block and this block will not be included as part of the parent chain. And this process continues. Now, how is the roll up chain constructed? So, in this case of these uh, traditional roll ups that I would like to call enshrined roll ups, because in this, in this case, the roll-up enshrines a bridge contract on the parent chain as the ground source of truth that would like determine what the actual roll-up chain is by accepting or rejecting the blocks. Now, and because of this feature, it's very easy to construct a roll-up chain. The roll-up full nodes will simply download the blocks from the parent chain. They will uh, ex execute the blocks and then they will construct the roll-up chain. Now, a much more simplified design is called a sovereign rollup. It's basically not adding to the previous slide, but taking stuff away from the previous slide. So in a sovereign rollup, again, we have a parent chain and a sequencer. But in this case, the parent chain does not have any bridge contract. So parent chain simply accepts any rollup block that is sent to it, and if it pays the transaction fees of including data. In this case, of course, there might be invalid roll-up blocks that are included as part of the parent chain. But that's okay, because I did not give the parent chain the task of um, executing roll-up blocks. I gave it the task of consensus and data availability. And in this case, the burden of identifying this ST2TX2 block is invalid falls on the roll-up full nodes. They will extract these roll-up blocks from the parent chain and you execute these roll-up blocks in order that is imposed on the blocks by the parent chain. And then they will, either, they will realize that SD2 is an invalid state. They will sanitize it. They will get rid of this block. And then they will construct the correct roll-up chain. This is the sovereign architecture. And well, it's uh, called sovereign because now the roll-up can choose whatever parent chain it wants to use. There is no bridge contract. OK, how has security been traditionally shown for the roll-ups? So uh, security for state machine application consists of two main, main uh, components. The first one is safety, the second one is liveness. And now I'm focusing on safety here, and traditionally safety has been shown relying on some trust assumptions. For instance, the parent chain has honest majority. And of course, for roll-ups, there are extra requirements uh, because now the validity check of, for the state is done by the full nodes outside the parent chain. For instance, in optimistic rollup, there is this assumption of network synchrony, the existential honesty assumption on an online watchtower, sometimes the parent chain's liveness, if it's an enshrined rollup, and so on. And in ZK rollups, of course, the proof system should be complete and sound. And, uh, but um, yeah, so, but in this talk, I would like to basically get rid of the trust assumption on the parent chain. So this is the uh, assumption we'll be targeting here. OK, how do we do this? Before I explain how we do this for a roll-up, I would like to explain how people have already done it for uh, blockchains where uh, single or monolithic blockchains. So it has been done through this concept of accountable safety. We say that a blockchain protocol satisfies accountable safety with some resilience F if it provides the following guarantees. The first guarantee is whenever there is a safety violation, all observers of the protocol should be able to identify uh, at least F adversarial validators of the blockchain protocol as protocol violators. And the second main requirement is that no honest validator should be identified as a protocol violator. So now, how is this going beyond the traditional way to prove safety? So traditional safety is proven in the following way. You assume there are less than F adversarial validators, and then using this trust assumption, you prove safety. But in this case, indeed, if there are less than F adversarial validators, safety is guaranteed. However, this thing says something more. It says, if there are more than F adversarial validators, and if these people engage in a safety attack, I will be able to provably identify them. I will be able to like, point them at them, and everyone will believe, it, believe in me. Now, how is this better than uh, just having a trust assumption? This is better because now, if these people engage in a safety violation, I can prove to everyone they are malicious, and I can have them impose financial punishments on these people. For instance, slashing. Like, if you guys were in Vitalik's talk, he was talking about slashing as well. And now I can maybe slash them. And this basically discourages these people from being adversarial and provides a more economic ground for security. Okay, so how does accountable safety work for blockchains? 
Let's see an example. So these are some examples of uh, accountable safe consensus protocols. So let's consider this a uh, blockchain protocol where these blocks are proposed and upon gathering, let's say, uh, two third uh, pre, um, uh, pre commit vote in the case of Tendermint, they get finalized, right? If there are enough people voting for the block, the block becomes finalized. And this enough number, let's say it's two thirds. Two thirds of the validators must vote for it. Now, if I have a safety violation, see there's a fork here and people are confused about which one is the correct one. This can only happen if both the top blocks and the bottom blocks, both of them have two thirds of the votes. But in this case, there must be an overlap, right? Like one third of the people must have voted for both the top blocks and the bottom blocks. But this is a protocol violation because the protocol says you cannot simply just vote on conflicting blocks. You, should, you can only vote on one block uh, and not, not conflicting counterparties. So in this case, by looking at the signatures on these blocks, I can identify the malicious parties that have double voted for them. And I can basically prove to everyone that these are malicious because I can show two signatures while I am assuming existential unforgeability, but I can just show these two signatures on these two conflicting blocks by the same party and then prove to you that they are malicious. Now this is a very oversimplified uh, <laughs> consensus protocol. If you wanna learn the details about how accountable safety work for blockchains, there was a great talk on BFT forensics earlier in SPC, so you can check out that. Okay, so how do we apply this idea to the rollups? Now this is kind of like a homework assignment. Um, and I will basically highlight the diffs, differences from the previous definition to this definition in color red, so it will become much more clear. So the first one is, we are now focused on the rollup chain, so I will be I will concern myself with the rollup chain. So I would say a rollup protocol or system satisfies accountable safety if it satisfies the following guarantees. The first one is, whenever there's a safety violation on the rollup chain, all observers should be able to prove and identify F adversarial parent chain validators as protocol violators. Now, if there's a safety violation on the rollup, I would identify the parent chain validators as malicious. And of course, I should not be identifying any honest parent chain validator. Now, you might ask, why is this a good notion, right? Like, why am I identifying the parent chain validators whenever there is something wrong on the rollup? Why don't I identify like the rollup full nodes or like clients? or the sequencer. Like, first of all, these roll-up full nodes or light clients are, they are external observers of the system. So they might not have any stake in the system. Now the sequencer might be a single entity. It might have like little stake. But now the people who are very much staked in the system are the parent chain validators. They bond money in the parent chain contracts to be able to execute the protocol as validators. So if I can somehow reduce the security to punishment of these validators, then I will be able to claim some economic safety guarantees. That is why I would like to identify the parent chain validators as malicious if something goes wrong on the rollup. Okay, so in the remaining half of the talk, I would like to prove this accountable safety guarantee for the rollups. Here, uh, but before that, just a quick reminder. So we have seen these uh, properties in the context of a blockchain protocol. Now I would like to basically repeat them in the context context of the rollup because they will be e they will make understanding proofs much easier. The f these three properties were consensus, data availability, and execution. And in the rollup system, consensus and data availability were the responsibilities of the parent chain validators, and execution or verifying the execution was the responsibility of the rollup full nodes or like clients. And I will basically use the sovereign uh, rollup uh, model because it's much simpler, it doesn't have this bridge contract uh, in the following proof. Okay, for the proof, I will analyze three cases of safety violations that happen due to the failures of these three properties, consensus, data availability, and execution. Okay, let's first look at consensus. So. This is the parent chain, this is the corresponding rollup chain. Now the parent chain grows, so does the rollup chain. Now the consensus was the responsibility of the parent chain, they failed their responsibility. There is a fork on the parent chain with two blocks that are both finalized with sufficiently many votes on them. Uh, 
And there's, the, there's of course a corresponding fork on the roll-up chain because the full nodes who are extracting the roll-up chain might be confused about which fork of the parent chain they should choose to extract the roll-up. Now, this is a safety violation and my guarantees tell me I should be able to identify the malicious uh, parent chain validators. And indeed, because there is a fork here, I can identify these malicious parent chain validators. If the parent chain provides accountable safety, then I will just look at these two blocks. I will look at the double signatures on them and say, hey, these are the malicious guys. So for this case, we are good to go. The second one is execution. So how can a fork happen due to execution on the roll-up chain? Now this is the parent chain. And suppose now this, there's a malicious sequencer who sneaked in an invalid transaction to the parent chain. Note that this does not happen in these traditional rollups because there's a bridge contract gating it, but uh, this could happen in a sovereign rollup. Now in this case, uh, adversary could claim, hey, SD2 prime, TX2 prime is the next correct rollup block because it seems to appear as the next rollup block within the parent chain. But in fact, I, I wasn't very being, to, being very truthful here. There will not be any safety violation in this case because the rollup full nodes, they would, upon executing TX2 prime, they will notice that this is an invalid rollup block. So they will not um, accept the adversary's claim as true. So instead, they will just choose the next valid rollup block to, as the block to extend the rollup chain. Okay, finally, this is the crux of the matter. We come to data availability. Now, how can a um, safety violation happen on the rollup chain due to a data availability issue? Let's consider this. This is a parent chain block, but part of its data is hidden. Well, there is a blockchain, there's, a, there's, a, there's this block header, and then the part of the block that contains the rollup data is available. It can be downloaded, but the validators are the malicious validators. They keep the part of the block hidden yet they still voted for this block and they make it seem like it's finalized. So this is a typical data availability attack. So in this case, what would happen? So I said before, these rollup full nodes, they download the rollup blocks from the parent chain, but they do not download all of the parent chain blocks. This is too much because it might have blocks from like, I don't know, like 50 different rollups. Why would you do this as a rollup full node? So they would download their block from this parent chain block and they would think everything is fine because their block is indeed available. They just downloaded it. So now they think this is the correct tip of the chain on the rollup side. But something else happens here. There are indeed people who realize something is wrong in this case because there are people who try to download all of the parent chain blocks and realize that the data is actually hidden. And if adversary per persists in this atta attack, um, social consensus mechanisms might come to help. So um, Vitalik was talking about some of these mechanisms. So what might happen is that the community comes together, or oh, let's see, like more than two thirds of the validators on the parent chain are compromised. They finalized an unavailable block. They don't reveal the data. What to do? Let's kick out these validators. Let's integrate a new validator set and uh, bootstrap the chain from the scratch, maybe from the last, last uh, valid block. So now they indeed do this, and then they restart the chain. But now, as you can see, a late coming rollup full node would think that the bottom one is the correct one. The bottom um, block on the parent chain is the correct one. So now we, we observe that there is a disagreement between the rollup full nodes who were earlier in the system and downloaded the block from the unavailable parent chain block, and the later rollup full nodes who downloaded the rollup block from the later parent chain block. Now, at this point, we do not have a accountable safety. The reason is these adversarial validators who kept the data hidden initially might reveal it later. So this is the typical fisherman's dilemma. Now, even though there seems to be a fork here, we cannot identify double signatures by malicious validators because the validator set on these two blocks are completely different. So how am I gonna provably identify like, to someone else that these people were malicious, right? Now, it seems like I have failed at my attempt to prove security, accountable safety. It seems like I cannot identify anyone uh, as malicious on the parent chain, even though there was a safety violation on the roll-up chain. Um, so am I gonna throw my hands off and walk off the stage? Uh, no. <laughs> I will require the roll-up full nodes 
to check the availability of the parent chain blocks before accepting a roll-up block from the parent chain block. So what I would do is that at this stage, I, would, I, I do not want the roll-up full nodes to accept ST2 prime, TX2 prime as a valid roll-up block because they should be checking the availability of the corresponding parent chain block, and upon noticing that the data is not available, they should not download this block and add it to their roll-up chain. But now I'm, I'm contradicting with myself, right? I have previously claimed these roll-up full nodes, they cannot download the whole parent chain block, and if they cannot download the whole parent chain block, how am I gonna know that data is not there? So this brings us to the, the punchline which is checking for data availability. So the roll-up nodes must, must check the availability of the parent chain blocks to attain an uh, accountable notion of safety. However, they cannot download the full roll-up block, so, sorry, full, full parent chain block. So what would they do? They would rely on something called a new holy grail in the blockchain space called data availability sampling. And uh, there are some examples of data availability sampling um, protocols here, so for, they have been uh, developed based on uh, erasure codes or er error correcting codes, uh, such as Reed Solomon codes, LDPC codes, and uh, KZG polynomial commitments. Um, this is currently uh, uh, being implemented by uh, many different blockchains, and it's an uh, area that still requires a lot of research. Um, as, but yeah, so this is currently the solution that we would need to ensure accountable safety for for rollups. And th that brings me to the final theorem of this talk. So the rollup satisfies accountable safety with resilience F for rollup full nodes if the parent chain satisfies accountable safety and the rollup full nodes can somehow check the availability of the parent chain blocks, for instance, through this data availability sampling methods. And uh, I haven't talked much about the light clients because there are some additional requirements on them, but the theorem is very similar for them, except that I also require, now in the case of light clients, because the light client doesn't download the full roll-up block, uh, it would need to somehow validate its state through some external mechanisms, maybe through the help of uh, fraud proofs or ZK validity proofs. Yeah, and this is indeed what happens the roll-up light clients, they down, only download the headers of the roll-up blocks that contain the state commitment, and they validate the roll-up blocks through the help of some fraud proofs or validity proofs created by the roll-up full nodes to extract the correct roll-up header chain. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great, we have time for questions. Um, any questions? So does the same result apply also for the enshrined roll-ups, or is this? Yes, it, it also applies. Actually, the, proving the result is simpler in that case, uh, because there is a bridge contract which already weeds out uh, invalid blocks um, from the parent chain. Is there any difference between enshrined and sovereign? Like, is there any benefit to one versus the other? Um, yes, there are differences. Well, in the case of um, in the case of sovereign rollups, the rollup has more freedom. It can, def it can choose between different parent chains. Uh, it doesn't have a contract that, uh, that it enshrines. But there are, it's much harder to support light clients in the case of uh, sovereign rollups because of the lack of execution on the parent chain. And, uh, but that is a separate matter. Um, like there are some works I have actually worked on, like uh, these uh, light clients for lazy blockchains and so on. Excellent, great. Any other, any other questions? Ah. Okay, looks like everybody's uh, maybe tired or happy or this was a fantastically clear talk. So everybody uh, got all the points, fantastic. All right, so let's thank uh, Nusrat one more time. Thank you. Okay, guys, so this brings us to the end of the SBC conference. This was our last session. So I hope everybody enjoyed the conference. Thank you all for coming. And, you know, as long as you keep coming, we'll keep running the conference. So I really look forward to seeing you next year. So, so long, everyone.